Hello, hello. Yeah, hello everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. I like to say thank you for, for welcoming me here in Mumbai, here in India. I think it's been a wonderful privilege already to have delivered a session uh, this morning. I actually played my board game with a, with a bunch of young, talented individuals who are very enthusiastic about wanting to learn about the very basics of business. And a lot of people, a lot of people who often come up to me and say, who is this young lad from London? We've never seen him, we've never met him, but he's, he does seem to have this charm, this good looks. Yes, I know, thank you. But putting that aside, putting that aside, why am I here? Because I've traveled the world to understand and learn different cultures and learn and understand different things about different people as to what makes them unique, what makes them different, and what makes them special to be able to go and pursue a career that they truly desire, that they truly want and want to be successful in. Because a lot of people often ask me, Sabrul, when you were young, what did you want to become? What sort of individual did you want to become? And do you know, my answer, typical like every other young person, maybe across the world, was I want to be famous. I want to be a celebrity. I want to be this individual which others will look up to and get a signed photograph and say, hey, I've got his autograph. And that's the sort of individual that I wanted to become. But what does that really mean? I want to be famous. Because it doesn't really define anything. It doesn't really define a career. It doesn't really have any prospects. Because when the media spotlight is on you, suddenly you're this world global phenomenon and suddenly the camera leaves you behind. You are a nobody. You are a nobody. But I couldn't pick that up straight away. Because when I tell you my story as to how I grew up, the way I grew up and how it's impacted my life and the individual that I've become, it's so clear that the fact that influence comes from those who are around you. Whatever career path you want to take, whether it's business, entrepreneurship, you want to be a doctor, you want to own your own restaurant, you want to be a lawyer, a doctor, whatever field you want to go down to, influence and inspiration comes from people who are close within. But nowadays, modern day society, modern day society have this whole influence upon fame, upon this culture where you want to ask a young person, what do you want to become? I want to be famous. Who's your role model? Jay-Z, Beyonce. Why? Jay-Z and Beyonce are like these wonderful people who are on top of Mount Everest. And we as ordinary young people, we are just taking our first step in life. First step up this mountain, we are looking up to Jay-Z and Beyonce who are on the summit. We're halfway there and suddenly we're almost falling off. We're almost falling off. And we're shouting out to Jay-Z and Beyonce, can you help me? Do Jay-Z and Beyonce listen? Do they listen? No. So how on earth are they the, these individuals who are role models, inspiration, who can change an individual's life? Yes, they may be wonderful people who want to portray a wonderful message. But at the end of the day, the connection isn't really there. So to be somebody who wants to succeed in a career path, you need to look for somebody who can mentor you, who can guide you, and who can teach you specific steps in life to help you get to where you want to go. But self-discovery is critical. And what I mean by that is, every single one of you here in this room has to know who you truly are as a person. When I ask a young person, who are you, where do you want to go, what do you want to do in life? I don't know. Why? Because young people don't give themselves enough time to think and often challenge themselves. What is good? What is unique about you? Because let me tell you this. When you yourself discover that one thing that is unique about you and you share it with your local community, you share it on a national scale, you share it globally, you'll realize that one day the world then suddenly starts coming chasing after you at all costs. It's reversing the role of society. Society teaches us specific things in life. You go to school, college, university, get a degree, fantastic. You've got your education. Education is wonderful. You need education to be, yes, to get you some, some point in life. But education, I don't think, is everything. Because you need to have other career prospects, other things doing on top of education as well. I went to school. I went to high school. 
Yes. And on top of that, I did multiple other things. Because I think when we are born and raised into this world, we are born with millions and millions of opportunities. But the issue we face in modern day society is that we are educated out of each and every one of those opportunities to whatever it is we are just taught in school. And often that comes as a very negative approach to education. But I'm not saying education is bad. Because you need education to be successful in life. But I'm saying that you can do things on top, independent learning. People often forget that to be somebody successful in life is not always about what the end result is. Because that's what's always portrayed, the end result. At the end of the day, you have to know the hard work that's been put in by an individual. You have to know that. And so, for me, where did inspiration come from? Now, my story starts when I grew up in a bar called Tower Hamlets in East London. You know, a lot of people often think London, you know, rich city, a lot of wonderful opportunities, etc., etc., etc. There's almost a million young people unemployed in London. And I'm thinking to myself, am I a part of this energy, this negative energy where there's no hope, no opportunity? I came from a, uh, my parents are from Bangladesh, they moved to the UK. And they were living off state benefits in the UK. Now I'm thinking to myself, this area in which I grew up, is this the world for me? And many people often see that. See that the city or the area, the, the region in which they grew up, it suddenly becomes the world for them. No. The world is much bigger than that. The world has opportunities. The world has unique things that you have yet to explore. And when you explore these opportunities, you suddenly realize specific things about you which you thought never ever existed. So when I realized that, yes, I'm in this borough in Tower Hamlets, inspiration was very difficult to find. My uncle told me, my uncle told me that I had to have a university degree to be considered successful because I was Asian. My uncle told me if I got into business, that the only business I could go into was set up a restaurant. Very stereotypical of him, being an Asian person growing up in London. And he told me that I couldn't set up a company until I hit the age of 30 or 40. And I thought to myself, gosh, I'm 13 years old at the time. And that's how my life really is going to go. Education on the way, hit the age of 21, 22, suddenly look for a job that I don't really like or I don't know what. For me, it's not about that. Because my cousin, he kind of broke that stereotype, being Asian, that you have to be 40 to set up a company. He set up his own company at the age of 14. He set up his own Yes, a very small calendar designing business in school, not to really make money, but really to plant a seed in life, to see where it takes him. He set that up at the age of 14, and I thought to myself, wow. How on earth does a 14-year-old have the guts, the decency to even set up his own company? For me, that completely blew me away. Not the fact that he was going to make money or the fact that he employed so many people in his company or the fact that he was doing something extraordinary, but the fact that he was able to do something at such a young age when his own dad told me that I have to be the age of 30 and 40. So it was very, very weird, but it, it completely blew me away. So when I heard that he set up his own company, I took an opportunity straight away. I went up to my cousin. I went up to my cousin, drew up a beautiful CV. I didn't have any experience whatsoever in business. It just looked fancy on Microsoft Word. Printed it out, gave it to my cousin, and said, Cousin, can I work for you? Yeah, I was employed at the age of 13. Many people often say it's child labor, but hey, I took the opportunity myself. <laughs> but I got a job at the age of 13 working for my cousin, and for me that was an absolute mesmerizing thing because to have that on my CV that I started working from the age of 13 his business idea was to design like I said calendars for teachers in school not the greatest of ideas but I had the role of being a production he made me director straight away so not an employer director so he didn't have to pay me a monthly wage very smart but at the end of the day at the end of the day because he was my cousin because I had this opportunity and he's my cousin he made 60 pounds profit, which is like how much? 480 rupees, 4,800 rupees in one whole academic year. And I thought to myself, wow, that's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. For me, because I've never got pocket money, I've never had my parents earn money. So 
I mean, it was a lot of money at, the, at that time. You made 60 pounds profit in one whole academic year. But the issue was, because he was my cousin, I just sat back, relaxed, enjoyed, let him make his own money, and he'd, I'd get paid. I'd get paid for the hard work he puts in. Two weeks later, I received my first ever letter through my home post. At the age of 13, I received my first ever letter under my name. I was so proud of myself. Receiving a letter. And all it said, it was beautifully signed by my cousin. His company name was the Royal Dragons. And all it said from the cousin who I saw as an inspiration, who I loved and followed my whole journey, Dear Sabir islam you're fired. <laughs> I was hired and fired by my own cousin at the age of 13. Now, I don't know whether you've seen the U.S. Apprentice or anything, but getting that finger pointed at you by a Donald Trump figure and telling you, you are not good enough, we get that often. We all get that in life. Somebody telling us that we are not good enough for who we are, for what we stand for, the, the effort we put in. Okay, maybe I didn't put in any effort. But for somebody to point that finger at me and tell me that I am not good enough to work for him, that I don't have the right attributes to be a part of his company, it hurt me so much. And people often get pulled down in life like that, in, in life like that get pulled down, face rejections, failures, and they often think their life is over. And for two weeks I did. I thought to myself as a 13-year-old at the time, gosh, is this where my life is taking me? Rock bottom. Yes, still in education, but my mind wasn't focused on the education. I got fired from someone who I loved and someone I saw as an inspiration. But I picked myself up. You need to have that moment of realization in life, such an epiph epiphany as such, where you realize at one point, actually, this finger pointing is not really going to get them anywhere. It's not really going to get me anywhere. So I picked myself up and said, cousin, I'm going to come back and I'm going to prove you wrong. And with that mentality, just to prove my cousin wrong, I set up my own company at the age of 14, not to make money. No, many people often set up businesses to make money. For me, it was just getting my own back on my own cousin. He fired me at the age of 13. I wanted to set up my own company. I set up a web design company at the age of 14. But you ask me, each and every one of you in this room ask me, do I know how to design a website? Does Sabir Islam know how to design a website? The answer is no. I ran a web design company for two years, but I don't know how to design a website. So what does that say? That you don't have to be a genius in something to be able to make something happen or be successful in life. It's not always about what you personally hold in there. Because believe in the power of people. People is everything. You may not have the skills, you may not have the attributes, but the person sitting next to you might have the one thing that you lack, that you so badly need to be that successful individual. So at the end of the day, two is better than one. Working together with people who have the skills necessary to be able to put together a team that can go and conquer something so big, and one day come back to prove their cousin wrong. So I put together a group of six wonderful friends who were all tech geniuses. Yeah, I utilized their services. Put together a company, made them directors, took my, like my cousin, made them directors so I didn't have to pay them a wage. And it was a wonderful experience. But my cousin sold calendars to teachers in school. I wanted to do something so big, different. Like I said, I wanted to be one step ahead of my cousin. My cousin employed five people in his business, I employed six. My cousin was a managing director, so I became a CEO. Each and every way, I wanted to be one step ahead of my cousin, just to purely prove him wrong. And that's the determination. There has to be some form of motivation pushing you in life. Whether how absurd, how bad, how negative it may sound, it has to push you forward. And there will be people who back, but you have to do things differently, outside the stereotype. As a young person, as a young person, we always thought when we were growing up, our parents used to teach us, our te a teacher used to teach us that in business you need to wear a snappy suit and hold a briefcase when you're talking to somebody. But we thought as a 14-year-old, we've got nothing to lose. We didn't want to sell the teachers in school. So what we did was, wearing our t-shirts and our tracksuit bottoms, went into big banks such as ABN AMRO, JP Morgan, Merrill Lynch, HSBC, huge investment banking companies in the city of London. Walked straight through their door past security guard, Every single employee that walked past, can we design your website? Can we design your website? Five other banks just grabbed us and threw us out. And how dare you? How dare a 14-year-old walk through our door? You have no right. But let me tell you this. 
It may have been wrong to just walk through those doors of the big banks, but we knew that as young people, we've got nothing to lose. We may get told off, yes, but at the end of the day, we can't, I can't go any lower than I was at that time. So for me, I hit rock bottom in life. So any other form of somebody telling me off that I did something wrong is not going to push it any lower. So we just took that risk. But being a 14-year-old, walking into the doors of these big banks, somebody at some point in life will see you completely different than many others. And that's a fact. 99.9% .9 of the world may look at you and think you're a fool for doing what you have done. But that 0.1% is actually all you need to push you forward. And walking through the doors of the 6th bank, Merrill Lynch, we walked through the doors of Merrill Lynch and said, can we design your website to every single employee that walked past? And suddenly, an employee's eyes just glowed. Wow. We've never had a 14-year-old walk through our door before. It was absolutely phenomenal for them to see the guts taken by, the, the risk taken by a 14-year-old just to walk through their doors and to actually pitch to them. It completely blew them away. So all we needed was 15 minutes, just sat down with them, explained who we are. My company was called Veyron Technology. Sat down with them, even had a contract ready there and then. Got them to sign it on the spot. My cousin made 60 pounds, which is like 4,800 rupees or so here. I made over 2,000 pounds profit in the first two weeks of running the business. And I thought to myself, wow, I can retire on that money as a 14 year old. <laughs> It was, it was such an incredible experience. And I never thought it would, it would come. Because at the end of the day, who made those choices? I chose to go up to my cousin. I, go, I, chose, I chose to be bad and I got fired. I chose to walk through the doors of these big banks. At the end of the day, the message is whenever you want to make something happen in life, you yourself have to make those first steps. At the end of the day, people can teach you so many different techniques, skills, attributes, whatever in life. But if you're going to be the one just sitting in that empty chair with a microphone and doing nothing, you're not going to go anywhere in life. And that's a fact. But my journey kind of continued because I never knew anything about business. Everything I did, I had to do through trial and error. And I was just having a conversation with one of the, 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 the guests, the hosts here. And uh, she was asking me, well, don't you have to know a lot about business to go into business? No, I didn't have a clue. I didn't study business study. I didn't do any of that. For me, everything happened through trial and error, understanding the fundamentals of business through, through making mistakes. And that's the beauty of business. You don't have to have this huge intellect to be able to become this superstar in business. And that's the beauty about it. It's one of the, those... Those areas, the careers where you don't need a degree, you don't need to have high levels of education. But it got me somewhere in life. I ran the company for two years until I hit the age of 16. When I thought to myself, hmm, website designing. It's not really my thing. It's not my passion. I don't know how to do it. I only set it up to prove my cousin wrong. And once he left school and I was there, you know, I was thinking, yeah, he's no longer around. To sh I can't really show off anymore, so he's gone. I closed the company down, but it wasn't to say it was the, it was the end of the world that I've you know, just suddenly cut off a part of my life, no. I wanted to take that onto my high school years on, and teach other young people how to get into business. But when you create an opportunity for yourself, the beauty about it is that un, on, on, an, on an unexpected day, one day that opportunity can come back to you without you even having a clue. Merrill Lynch came back to me at the age of 16. They came back to me and said, Sabral, we've been following your journey. You were born and raised in a society that sees crime, violence, drugs, alcohol as a way forward. Your parents have never worked. Yet, at the age of 14, while still in school, you become an entrepreneur. Now, that is something different. And so they gave me the opportunity to go to New York for the first time. They gave me the opportunity to go to New York to learn how to trade in the stock market. Oh, my God, I was so scared. I was so scared. I was such a mummy's boy till the age of 16, and I admit that. I have no shame in admitting I was a mummy's boy, but at the end of the day, I had to let go of my mum's hand at the age of 16. Such a painful experience. But when I went over to New York, I was working alongside professional traders in the Dow Jones and New York Stock Exchange. Wonderful experience. Just two weeks it took. 
for me to really understand and learn the basics. I came back to London and I became a, a, a junior trader in the London Stock Exchange at the age of 16. And then suddenly, I had a huge wave of young people asking me, dude, you're still a teenager, you become an entrepreneur, you become an investor, what's wrong with your social life? I say to people, yeah, social life is fantastic. You know, a social life is wonderful. I like playing the football. I like playing the cricket. I like playing my PlayStation. But it's not really going to get me that far in life. And I've had to sacrifice four and a half years with my, to, to not even see my closest friends to be the individual that I am. And a lot of young people, when I say that, find it difficult to accept because their best friend is their world. Their best friend is their rock. They can't move away from their best friend. And sometimes you re don't realize that in fact your best friend can be the person who is holding you back. And it's a, it's a harsh reality because you are a forward-minded person. But often the people who you hang around with are not. But it's not to say not everybody is forward-minded. Of course they can be. If they're able to learn and understand them and how to develop that sort of mentality. But sometimes people hold you back. But whenever these young people were asking me this question, how did you become an entrepreneur? How did you get into investing? For me, it was, it was quite a challenge to give them a straightforward response because you have to understand the journey. Because if anybody asks me today, okay, Sabrul, what do you do? And if you're a doctor, I could, you could say, easily say I'm a doctor. If you've got a, a degree in your PhD, whatever, I could say you've you got a PhD. But for me to be able to explain my sort of business, what I do today, they need to hear the story. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. And that's, the, that's something that often occurs you know, through entrepreneurship. You can't really explain the field you're in. But to, to give these sort of hints and tips and advice to young people, I thought at the age of 17, I need to give them something. So I wrote my first book at the age of 17, called The World at Your Feet. And uh, the, real, the book is, is really just a, a simplified, ver a motivational book to, to give them ideas and understanding as to how to develop a positive mindset. Because a lot of people I knew at the time were growing up in very poor communities. And they needed some form of help, advice from young role models. And role models are key. Like I mentioned before, you don't need celebrities. You need people in your local community who have done something who you can relate to. And who you can one day look up and say, they are my role model. And in reverse, you do something one step ahead. And that's how it works. And so when I wrote this book, I approached 40 different publishers. 40. 40 different publishers to get this book published. And do you know what happened? I got rejected by each and every one of those 40 publishers. Why? For two reasons. One, because I was 17 at the time. They thought a 17-year-old can't even write a book. And the other reason was the fact that they thought a young person wouldn't come up to me and say, Sabrul, can I buy your book? But it was once again that moment when somebody was pointing that finger at me. They were pointing that finger at me and telling me, Sabrul, you are not good enough. And whenever somebody points the finger at me and says to me that I am not good enough, it just wants to motivate. It motivates me to want to pick myself up and come back and prove them wrong. And when you have that positive mentality, no matter how bad the situation is in life, if you always maintain that positive mentality, any obstacle in life is just a mere glitch. And so, as you can see, I designed the book myself. I am not the greatest artist in the world, but. Having designed the book myself, I wrote the book, edited the, everything I did myself, self-published this book. And that's what opened doors for me to become a motivational speaker at the age of 17. Never, ever, ever, ever did I think I'd become a speaker. I had the opportunity to speak in front of a few head teachers, head masters in, in schools across the UK. And uh, it kind of boomed from there because every school wanted to buy, purchase copies of the, of the book. And for me, it was a wonderful experience to have known nine months down the line that the book was going to sell 42,500 copies in the space of nine months. And during those nine months, in order to make those sales happen, I spoke at 379 events whilst in high school to reach out to those young people who these publishers said I could not reach out to. And that's when I sold 42,500 copies of the book. And do you know what happened? Each and every one of those 40 publishers who rejected me, each and every one of them came back. Several. 
We've heard you sell over 40,000 copies of your book. We now want to get it professionally published for you. The moment they said they wanted to get my book professionally published, having initially rejected me, I stood there on stage and I gave them the hand, saying, I don't think so. Because if you yourself don't believe in who you are as an individual, why would the rest of the world? Because I was being arrogant at the time. I just rejected 40 publishers. How many people get offers from 40 publishers? But I thought to myself, I was on cloud nine. I was on cloud nine, but I was thinking to myself, wow, what have I done? I've just rejected 40 publishers. And I got a phone call. I got a phone call from the cousin who fired me. <laughs> yeah. He gives me a phone call and says, one very important thing. I, I didn't want to answer his call, but he withheld the number, so I didn't know who he was. But he explained to me that no matter how bad the situation is in life, he told me one very important message that completely changed my mentality. It's never, ever, ever, ever be arrogant in life. That's all he said. That's all he told me. Because when you're arrogant in life, people don't respect you. And respect is one of the most powerful things you can earn in life. Respect. And for me, having thought that I was on cloud nine, he brought me right back down to earth. And I had to rebuild that trust amongst people. That I'm not this individual that suddenly gone on cloud nine and thinking I'm untouchable. No, I was brought right back down to earth and I saw the individual that I'd become because I managed to, to get myself up there. And I thank him for thanking Thank him for bringing me right back down to earth because it taught me a very valuable lesson about respect. When people respect you, they one day see you as you are as a role model. As an inspiration, parents one day look at you and say, I wish my son and daughter was like him or her. And that is such a proud feeling to have inside. But sometimes there comes an extent where I wish my son and daughter to become like him or her starts turning into wedding proposals. And that... I'm afraid is, is not ideal for me. I've received over 400 wedding proposals in the past three years. Yeah. But I just want to apologize to any single men here. So uh, i just like to apologize. But putting that aside, having, having rejected these 40 publishers, for me, it was all about networking. Because the power of developing a network is, is crucial. In any, so any form of business, any form of career, people is power, like I mentioned. I had to do a lot of networking on business, uh, networking sites like LinkedIn, Academy, uh, even social media, Twitter, Facebook, to be able to put myself out there. And etiquette is very important as well. A lot of young people, when they even, even connect with me, thinking that, yes, he's a young dude, he'll understand what we're talking about. No, I don't. Because when they're using street language to be able to talk to me, or language which is inappropriate, or language which is mistakes with, you know, with grammar, it's a simple things have a huge effect. Because the person doesn't know you from the other side. So you have to present yourself well. So I introduced myself. I'm Sabro I'm 17 years old. I just sold 42 and a half thousand copies of my self-published book. I need to get it professionally published. Can you help me? And those words at the end, can you help me? A lot of people fear that. Simple words which a lot of people fear and I have no idea of why. Because people are brought into this world to be able to do good for others. Yes, there are a few who don't do good. But majority of the world want to do good, want to create change, want to help people, want to make a difference. Because one day you'll become this individual that's a superstar and other people would want to say that they were a part of your journey. So it's great to be able to connect with people, especially at a young age, and share who you are as a person. That is so powerful. So I, I managed to, to uh, do a lot of networking, got my book professionally published at the age of 18 through a mainstream publisher based in Singapore. And uh, the book, again, The World at Your Feet, but read the, change the title a bit to Three Strikes to a Successful Entrepreneurial Life. And this is now selling globally, the book. And in fact, going back a year when I wrote the first book, I, I took a, a kind of a, a punt at a magazine, because I, I never really was good at um, paying and marketing. I was always good at self-promoting, etc., on, on a free basis. I never really spent any money to be able to do business. And that's the other thing. A lot of people think in business you have to spend so much money my first business, web design business, didn't cost me a penny. The money I made from that I used in the stock market. I exited, exited the stock market just before the recession. Because I was given good advice by Merrill Lynch to be able to exit before the recession. But at the end of the day, having 
developed all that money, I just invested, reinvested, self-funded everything. So I never really got a loan, never got a grant from anybody or from anywhere. At the end of the day, if you have an idea, it's best to start small and grow it. But going back here, like I said, when I was 17 years old, I, I took a punt. I, that's the only time I paid around 600 pounds to be on a magazine to get my word out to every single university across the UK. And suddenly, I get a, a phone call. I get a, a phone call from somebody I did not expect. You would not expect to get a phone call from this person. I got a phone call from the former first lady of Nigeria. God knows how she got my number. But she gives me a phone call and says, Sabrina, I've read this article in, your, in, in this magazine. I hung up thinking it was a prank call first. But, but I, she called back again. And I thought to myself, the former first lady of Nigeria is just calling me. I was left stunned. I was like in, in shaking a bit. But she read this article and she wanted to, so she was so inspired, she wanted to invite me to go over to Nigeria. And I was completely blown away by this invitation. That I, when I told my mom, she goes, no, Nigeria is dangerous, no. no. <laughs> but you kind of have to take the opportunity because opportunities often come once in a lifetime. I took the opportunity to go to Nigeria, accepted the invitation, flew over to Lagos and experience. And all it said was every mile I drive by, all it said was, welcome to Nigeria, Sabiru. And it was such a wonderful, wonderful experience to know that a country would go to extreme lengths just to bring you over. And just to hear a story, a message that can motivate and inspire. Maybe not everybody, but the few who it does inspire for them to one day go and do something. And that's what exactly happened. I was so inspired myself to have gone over to Nigeria, spoken at many events. And uh, there was one guy that really stood out for me. One guy. And uh, he, met the, he was around 23 years old at the time, and he was so inspired, he went on to write his own book to inspire fellow young Nigerians. Three months later, after getting his book professionally published in Nigeria, he flew back to London. He flew to London. And I am flown to London. He somehow manages to get my address, comes knocking on my door one morning, and I opened the door, and there he was, just to shake my hand and say, Sabro, you have changed my life. And for me, that was one of the most proudest moments of my life. For somebody to just fly over all the way from Nigeria to come and just shake my hand and say, you've changed my life, it brought tears to my eyes. That was priceless. No amount of money, fame, or success will ever beat that feeling or emotion you get inside. And that is when I discovered my true passion. To want to inspire and change the lives of young people, not just in the UK, but globally. Which is why I set up the Inspire One Million campaign. A global campaign I set up really to motivate and to share this exact same story, but on a greater depth with young people globally. And over the past 18 months, I've been to around 25 different countries. 25 different countries over the past 18 months to be able to inspire people from all walks of life, from South America to South, South, Southeast Asia to, to across Europe to, to South, Southern Africa. It's been absolutely phenomenal. And the greatest thing is every country you go to, every country opens their arms to you. And I never thought that because my parents have never traveled. Yes, they're from Bangladesh, but that's all they know, Bangladesh and the UK. They've never been to any other country. And for me to be the only person who's actually traveled to all these countries, I am grateful for that. Because opportunities, I always look back to that one day. That one day I received that letter from my cousin, Dear Sabiro Islam, you are fired. Would I have ever thought I'd be standing here on this stage right now? No. So how does a journey happen like that? It's because you want it to happen. It's because you put the guts and effort in to make it happen. And there's something I call the seven Ps, which I want you to write down if possible. Because it's very, very simple words that have really changed my mentality. And you've heard this through the talks and I'm sure from other people as well. Simple words. The first P is positivity. Because every single negative thing that's happened to me in life, I've always kept a positive mentality, wanting to come back and proving these people wrong. That's how I've gone. That's my mentality, no matter how hard it is. The next is passion. Follow your passion. Do what you love doing. I was told to go to university and get a degree. And let me tell you this, I have yet to go to university. 
Because the reason why I haven't gone to university is because I don't know what I want to study. Yes, a degree is wonderful, but I don't want to study a degree which is no value to me whatsoever. Do something you love and study something you want to study because you know where it's going to take you. And it's because you love, you love doing it. Next is perseverance. Perseverance, hard work. But hard work, you wake up one morning but you have a plan. You have a plan that morning. What is your goal for that morning? I want to accomplish this, this and that. During this morning, during this week. You know, work hard. And the next is persistence. Keep knocking on people's doors. Keep making things happen. Keep communicating. Keep going on a day-by-day -day basis. The next is purpose. And for me, this is one of the most valuable ones. Purpose. Live life with meaning. If I was to ask you, what, if you leave this world today, what will you be remembered for? Will you be able to answer that? What does the world know you for? What do you stand for? What is your legacy? All these famous, famous people who have left this world have left a mark. Do they care about money? No, they do not. Money is very easy to make in this world. In a capitalist society, it's very easy to make, but the real challenge is to be able to make a difference. And that is where you make your name. If you're able to make a difference in this world, you go somewhere so far, you change the lives of millions, and you get remembered by millions. And that is what purpose is all about. Where does your legacy leave you? The next is patience. And by the way, Sabirul, my name means patience. And for me, it's one of the most important ones as well, because nothing happens overnight. Like I said, I started my journey at the age of 13, having been fired. I'm now 22 years old. Nine years. Nine years it's taken me to come and step here in Mumbai. I was patient enough. Nine years. But you have to be patient enough to be successful in life. And the next P is believe in the power of people. And I've mentioned this throughout the talk. People, I would not have done any of this without all the people who have supported me in my networks, all the people who have supported me across the world. And you ask me, do I employ anyone? The answer is no. I don't employ anyone, but I know there are people out there who are willing to support what I do because I want to make a difference. Not for money. Yes, I'm an entrepreneur, but I'm a social entrepreneur. I want to create some form of change in this world. Make a difference somehow. And not everybody will remember who I am. But the few who do, I am grateful. And I thank them. And I thank you all for coming because at the end of the day, you chose to come here. You chose to take that opportunity. There are, there's a billion other people who could have come to this, but no, they chose not to. So you should pat yourself on the back for coming. And for me, my journey continued. I've now got many other ventures. I started a speaking agency just a few years ago, which has some of the world's most influential young speakers, including another speaker who will be here tomorrow, Fraser Doherty, who's also part of my speaking, um, speaking uh, speakers bureau. And also, I set up the board game, which we played. Uh, let me just quickly show you the, the game. I, I developed this at the age of 18 to really teach young people financial literacy. I developed this with a bunch of young people aged 11 to 15 who helped me create this game over a period of 10 months uh, prior to the launch of my book. I even launched many other books as well. This one, I've got a multiple copies if you like one. It's called The Young Entrepreneur World. And it contains interviews with some of the world's most influential young people who want to create change in this world. They're young people who are change makers, who, who have done something that has influenced the lives of others. There are, yes, there are multimillionaires. Some of them are multimillionaires. But their focus isn't on the money, their focus is on want, wanting to make a difference and how they went about doing it, stories you hear through this book. I've got multiple copies if you would, if you would like to, to purchase any of these copies. And uh, so for me, it's all about giving young people opportunity. An opportunity came for me, one last thing I'd like to just quickly mention is, having turned the age of 19, I set up a training program to educate young people globally as part of the Inspire One Million campaign. So I have developed a, a training program, even with further books and, and DVDs. So uh, it's called uh, the Teen Entrepreneur Success Kit, and uh, it follows what I call the cycle of success. Teaching young people the why factor, trying to get them to understand self-discovery, getting them to understand personal branding, and how you go about setting up a company. Because the stereotype in business is that you need a, a business idea and money. I'm trying to eradicate that. In business, you need to understand yourself. Self-discovery, where it comes from. Your strengths and attributes, you may think you're an entrepreneur, but at the end of the day, you're not. 
You know, so at the end of the day, you have to find out who you truly are. The next is branding. How people get to recognize you and how opportunities come to you. I didn't knock on the doors of India, India came to me. So how did that happen? You develop a powerful brand that is recognized globally. That is what you have to do. And the next is all about setting up a company. How you go about doing that. The business ideas, the research that you have to do. And each of these three books come with their own DVDs and they're available for purchase as well if you'd like a copy. So, so that's my story. I'm not 22 years old. I've got years to go until I really accomplish and make a real difference in this world. But it's, it's a start. So I hope I've inspired you all to bring the world at your feet. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, a huge round of applause for Sabar al-Islam. Um, because we're running out of time, uh, we would be requesting only two people who could ask questions. So if anyone has uh, anything to speak about or ask questions in terms of anything could be spoken, so just two of you. Sure, sure. I want to ask that uh, team preneur, your board team, how did you publicize it throughout uh, 14 countries? Uh, did you go and make seminars in every country and ask them to buy your book? How did you go about it? For me, I took an alternate approach than mainstream because I don't believe in mainstream. Mainstream often is it's always in being in the spotlight and the media and I don't like that. For me, it's all about connecting with the people within those countries and selling them what you truly value. You know, I, my board game, my books, everything I did, I did through the education system within specific countries. So those 14 countries where my game sold to, it was all done through the education system. So it's now used as part of the business studies qualification in those 14 countries. So sales generate through that and I sold over 300,000 copies, yeah. You went there and sold Yeah. Is that a question? All right. One last question to the gentleman at the back. Uh, Okay, even you have. Okay, we'll entertain. So if you could go ahead. I want to know that you have given us 7.7 P's. Uh, one thing which I personally feel missing is you have not told anything about your team. My team? Okay. Team work or team like that. Okay. The first company I, I worked uh, the, with, the, the web design company, they were all my friends who were all, uh, like I said, very good in, in technology. And... Uh, they had different attributes, so uh, I, I decided to, to give them uh, different roles, for example, made them sales director, marketing director, anything that I, I specifically felt they were good at, you know, I got them to, to come together and actually to share their skills, get them to realize what they're capable of doing. So sometimes I gave them a role which initially wasn't for them. So then we had to switch with other people, do a trial and error to find out which role specifically fitted which person. So that way we got to learn a bit more about them. Other teams, for instance, who organize my events, etc., globally, they are people I've tapped into through social media, through networks, through speaking at events like this. There may be somebody who comes and says, oh, I've got an event here, I'd like to organize this for the Inspire One Million, things like that. They're just a, a group of people who, who like to host and facilitate events, but with a mindset to create positive change. So that's the, how I created my team. My, your team doesn't have to be all geniuses. Are you still a mama's boy? Yes or no? That's all. I let go of my mama's hands at the age of 16. So, uh, but I, I, I'm very proud to be a mama's boy, but uh, I hope uh, it's not, you know, affected any other girls from giving me proposals. So, uh, I'm still happy. Okay, one last question. If you could just stand up. Thank you so much. I'm glad nobody is asking for marriage proposals right now. <laughs> Hi, hi, Sabirul. Uh, guys, I just want to tell you, three years ago, I saw Sabirul's video online, and I was 16 years old, and after seeing what Sabirul has done, I thought, why can't I do this with my life? And today, based on what Sabirul has done, I've also written my book, and it's because people like Sabirul have come out. So can you have a big round of applause for Sabirul again? And the fact that he's only 22 and he's done it, it shows you that everyone in this crowd can have, can have a Sabirol in yourself as well. So another big round of applause for him, please. Thank you.